Let's go through the 10 most common mistakes architects make when detailing brick veneer facades. From wrong brick dimensions to poorly detailed membranes and misplaced weep holes. These mistakes can cause leaks, stains and even mold growth. At best they delay projects and cost stakeholders money. At worst they lead to serious building failures. Brick veneer is the most widely built facade system in the UK and Northern Europe. People trust real brick buildings, even in our language. We invest in brick and mortar business. But here's the problem. Masonry brick veneer facades almost never get a facade engineer appointed unless it's a part of a complex bespoke building. Instead, architects and structural engineers are left to design them on their own. And all too often the construction is procured through a labor-only contractors, a gang of bricklayers building straight from the drawings without producing shop drawings or coordinated facade details. This means brick facades often get built with no design specialist involvement, no coordinated detailing and sometimes no design at all. Warranty providers, who eventually pay for the failures, have published guidance to address this. But the same mistakes keep on happening. My name is Eugene Korch, I am a practicing facade engineer and I teach facade engineering at the Institute for Architectural Science and Technology. Let's go through the 10 most common mistakes in masonry brick veneer facades and how to avoid them. The most common mistakes is failing to design to the brick module. For example, a standard British brick size is 215 by 102.5 by 65 mm. Mortar joints are nominally 10 mm. That gives the coordinating size of 225 by 112 0.5 by 75 millimeters. Everything in the facade should reference these modules. Window widths and heights, floor to floor setting out, sills, reveals and returns. If you ignore the module, you create forced cuts, ugly perp joints and tolerance problems at corners and openings. Let's look at the coordinated dimensions commonly referred to as CO. CO minus means brick only. That's the brick work size with no joints. Use it to size pierce or narrow areas between openings. CO means brick plus one joint. That's the coordinating size. Use it for panel width. Opposite returns like a wall length from external corner to internal corner. CO plus means brick plus two joints. Use it for openings because there is a joint on each jamb or head interface. So here is an example of a common mistake. An arbitrary 1200 millimeters wide window. A junior architect sets a window opening at 1200 mm clear. For openings we use CO plus dimension, in this case 5 bricks plus 6 joints. The closest dimensions for the window opening should be 1135 mm. If you hold 1200 mm, you'll end up forcing cuts or compromising the nominal mortar joints dimensions to make the bond work. That hurts performance and looks messy. Now the corner example. Don't set an arbitrary distance from window jam to the corner. Make the return a multiple of the coordinated size. That return should be number of brick multiplied by CO. 225 mm, 450 mm, 675 mm and so on. If you place a window at an arbitrary distance from the corner, the brick bond won't work. To fix it on site, the brick layers has only one option, shift the cavity at the corner return. In other words, the bond is kept, but the cavity is stolen. And that takes us straight to the mistake number two, compromising the cavity. One of the biggest hidden problems in brick veneer facades is compromised cavity. If the brickwork isn't set up properly, the bricklayer often fixes it on site by stealing from the cavity. That means pushing the brick return further inside, reducing the cavity width. Concrete has about 10 mm tolerance. Brickwork has about 10 mm tolerance too. If the design only allows for an inch, a 20 or 25 mm cavity, those tolerances alone may close it up completely. The insulation ends up being pressed tight against the back of the brickwork. And remember, brick is porous, so is the mineral wool insulation. If they touch, water can pass directly through by a capillary action. That's why warranty providers insist on minimum clear cavity. The standard requirement is 50 mm clear and unobstructed. But in areas of severe exposure with driving wind and rain, the requirement increases. For example, LABC guidance calls for 75 mm minimum in severe exposure zones. So the designing a cavity smaller than this is a critical mistake. But there is another way the cavity gets compromised. Architects often design decorative patterns, protrusions and and recesses in the facade. Instead of pushing the brickwork out, they sometimes pull it in. That reduces the cavity and squeezes the insulation. Even details where every second brick is recessed cause this problem. It looks nice on paper, but on site it destroys the cavity. Suddenly that 15 meter clear space is gone. Recessed brickwork also creates a second problem. When laying recessed brick, mortar droppings easily fall into the cavity. Those droppings 
block the path for water to drain down the weep holes. So even if the cavity started clear, it doesn't stay that way. To summarize, never use the cavity below 50 mm clear. In severe exposure zones, allow 75 mm. Avoid recessing brickwork into the cavity and always design with construction tolerances in mind. Because once the water is in the cavity, it has to get out. And that takes us straight to the next detail. A clear cavity means nothing if water has no way out. That's why weep holes and cavity trays are critical. Weep holes should always be positioned at the bottom of the cavity, just above the cavity tray. They should be spaced every 900 mm or roughly every three bricks. And every window needs at least two weep holes, yet you rarely see them drawn on architectural details. That's why the best practice is to add the annotations on the drawings, for example, the annotations we have on the facade intelligence platform for the brick masonry weep holes. That one simple note avoids endless side mistakes. But space isn't the only issue. The real problem is how weep holes are drawn in relation to cavity trays. British Building Regulations approved document C requires a minimum drop of 150 mm from the inner leaf to the outer leaf. That drop ensures water can clear safely. Here's a quick way to check. A brick plus mortar joint is 75 mm. If your cavity tray doesn't step down at least two full brick courses, that's two brick and two joints, it's not compliant. And the cavity trays should always be placed wherever the cavity is blocked. That means above lintels, shelf angles, foundations, and fire barriers. And speaking of fire barriers, their placement and size create another common mistake in brick veneer facades. Fire barriers save lives, but only if they are detailed and positioned correctly. Too often they are just drawn as a token line on sections and that's where the trouble starts. Approved document B is clear. Cavity barriers must be placed around all windows and doors, at every floor slab, at party walls and at base and top of the cavity, and vertically no more than 20 meters apart. An HBC goes further. They require barriers as close as possible to external corners and no more than 1.5 meters from internal corners, and vertical barriers should be spaced no further than six meters apart. Most architects get this right in plans and elevations. The mistakes appear in section. The problem is size. To achieve the two hours fire resistance that's 120 minutes of insulation and integrity, a masonry cavity barrier must be around 120 millimeters thick. That's almost two full brick courses, and it needs to sit fully within the slab zone. Yet in many drawings, barriers are sketched as one course thick. On site, they simply don't fit. Something else has to give. Either the cavity tray dimension above the barrier is compromised, remember it needs to be 150 millimeters, or the structural shelf angle brackets is squeezed out of its position. And that brings us directly to the next mistake. The shelf angle bracket is the backbone of brick veneer facades. Get it wrong and everything else above it fails. Architects often draw the brackets, the cavity barriers and the cavity tray indicatively, all crammed in the slab zone. But every one of these has strict minimum dimensions. Let's start with the bracket itself. To carry one or even two floors of brickwork, the bracket needs a lever arm of at least 130 mm. Most systems add another 20 mm for tolerances. So in practice, the lever should be 150 mm minimum. And that's exactly where the casting channel must be positioned. On top of that, the bracket usually needs another 50 mm of extension above the channel. Now at the fire barrier. Now we know to achieve 120 minutes of fire resistance, the barrier usually should be 120 millimeters thick. And it has to sit either just above or just below the bracket, depending on the bracket system. When you put those dimensions together, the slab zone needs to be at least 320 millimeters. For safety and tolerance, 330 millimeters is better. That's why upstands or downstands at the slab edge are often recommended. But too often the slabs are drawn at only 270 mm. The bracket is too small, the fire barrier is too thin, and on site there is a clash. Either the cavity tray is compromised or the barrier has to be cut to allow for bracket installation. Thicker slabs with edge upstand or downstand also help with deflection. They reduce life load movement and make it easier to control joints. And that leads us to straight to next common mistake, movement joints. Brick doesn't forgive movement. If you don't allow for it, the wall will crack. The most common mistake is forgetting horizontal joint just below shelf angle bracket. Every slab deflects under life load, furniture, equipment, people. If brickwork is dead loaded at the slab, it has to move independently. And that joint cannot be mortar. It must be compressible, backing rod with sealant or expanding foam tape. And if the slab edge has no downstand or upstand, deflection can reach 5 to 10 millimeters. That means the joint must be sized accordingly, not just sketched as a token 10 millimeters. Vertical movement joints matter just as much. Warranty providers call for joints in clay brickwork every 
10 to 12 meters. And the joint size depends on the spacing. As a rule of thumb, allow 1.3 millimeters per meter with a maximum spacing of 12 meters. That means joints up to 16 millimeters wide, but never less than 10 millimeters. The first vertical movement joint should also be within six meters of a corner. And remember, joints should not run through window openings. Continuing a movement joints across frame and lintel rarely works in practice. Which brings us to another frequent problem, lintels. And the mistakes here can be costly. The most common design error in lintels is the top corner of the window opening. It should be always a full brick. Every lintel must extend at least 150 mm beyond the opening and that bearing must sit on a full masonry unit, not half a brick. Overhang is another detail to check. Bricks should never project more than 25 mm past the edge of the lintel. Then comes drainage. A cavity drain must sit directly above every lintel. It needs a stop end at each side of the opening. And cavity tray in lintel zone should be shaped to provide 100 mm vertical projection above point where the mortar droppings could collect. And we already know they should be minimum 150 mm high. Weep holes should be built into this detail, at least two per opening. Finally, you have to protect the window below. NHBC and LABC require damp-proof cores over the lintel that projects out as a drip detail. Without it, head stains, leaks, and the frame deteriorates early. And that brings us to damp-proof courses, not just above lintels, but across the whole facade. Everyone knows you need a damp-proof course at the base of the wall, at least 150 mm above ground level, terrace or balconies. Often the first two or three courses are even covered by a flashing or made of a darker brick because everyone expects them to stain over time. Below sills, copings or any porous stone or concrete details, DPC is essential. Without it, the water tracks straight into the brick below. But the most common mistake is not at the base or the sill, it's at the cavity barriers. Brick is porous, mineral wool in the cavity bears is porous too. If the two touch without separation, water can wick straight from the outer leaf into the barrier and deeper into the wall. And that is why NHBC standards require DPC membrane between the cavity barriers and the brickwork. Horizontal barriers needed, vertical barriers needed too, especially at window reveals where the problem is worst. Too often this detail is missed on drawings and missed on site. The result could be mold, growth of moss, stains, where still the cavity fire barrier may deteriorate over the years and when you need it most. And that takes us to the window reveals, coppings and sills, where detailing is just as critical. Window reveals are detail where mistakes show fast. One of the mistakes is how deep the window is set into the facade. The ideal recess is either half a brick or a full brick. If it's a full brick, you'll need a reveal support plate. Go deeper than that and you'll likely need extra masonry support at the slab. Deep reveals are possible but expensive. At that point, brick slips or precast concrete may be a better option. Flush windows are another problem. In severe exposure zones, warranty providers don't allow windows to be flush with the face of the brickwork at all. The outer brick leaf should cover the window by at least 25 millimeters. And if you position the window frame flush with the face of the brick, not only you will get stains on the facade below, you will also create a risk of the surface condensation on the window profile and potentially on the gypsum board reveal internally. LABC standards also call for sill to project at least 25 millimeters past the brickwork below. And the drip recess should project at least 10 millimeters clear of the wall face. Finally, remember the brick ties. A first tie should always be within 225 millimeters of the reveal. If you design a lightweight steel frame behind, place a stud about 150 millimeters from the window opening. Which brings us to the brick ties themselves and the mistakes that come with the bonds and tie layouts. It is a good practice to show wall ties at least 50 mm embedded into the mortar joint with a drip in the middle pointing downwards. In double leaf masonry, where the facing brick is tied back to the blockwork, designers don't need to draw every tie. You can rely on NHBC or LABC guidance for spacing and placement. Since the same contractor builds both leaves, workmanship usually covers this detail. But with stud wall, it's different. The studs are installed by a separate contractor, and they don't always consider where the brick ties will land. That's why the stud must be placed 150 mm from every window opening. Too often this stud is missed. Without it, the ties can be fixed where they are required within 225 mm of the reveal. Other studs should be spaced at 600 mm centers. This allows the brick layers to set out ties according to warranty guidance. But remember, the standards only apply to traditional stretcher bond or maybe Flemish bond. These bonds interlock and share loads between bricks. Other patterns like horizontal or vertical stack bonds 
don't. They need extra reinforcement. That means bad joint reinforcement and much tighter tie spacing. Either way, a facet engineer must be involved. And the solution will be bespoke and expensive. Stack bonds also mean more studs, more thermal bridges and worse thermal performance. That is why, in many cases, it's better to use ventilated brick slip systems or precast panels instead. There are many other details in brick veneer facades, but if you avoid the 10 mistakes we've just covered, you will already eliminate most of the risks. Don't worry if you missed anything. All the 3D details and drawings shown in this video are also available on our case studies on the Facade Intelligence platform. There you will find CAD drawings, specifications and standard annotations. Everything you need to detail these facades correctly. The link is below. If you found this video useful, please feel free to share it with your colleagues and subscribe to our channel. There are many more videos on facade engineering and other types of facades from curtain walls to precast to rain screen cladding. Feel free to ask any questions in the comments sections. We read them all and we are happy to reply. And finally, there will be a full webinar on brick masonry design. We'll go much deeper into these details. Depending on when you are watching this, the recording may already be available for IST and facade intelligence members. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.